on to our panel discussion. So hopefully you will you will and um, Aoife will be um, available for for as a, as our panel to answer some of the questions from our from our audience. Um, so I think this might uh, be quite handy for all of you to answer. So it's just a follow up on Karenza's actual question about the you know if you have if you're a symptomatic uh, family member who then get um, gets a um, uh, ha has a pathogenic vari uh, variant for long QT, you're then classified as having long QT. But then um, she was thinking that how come in insurance then you have to reveal, um, you don't have to reveal your predictive testing result, but you have to reveal a diagnosis and that impacts on insurance. I wonder if you could, you could comment on that. Um, just before you start um, answering everybody, Tessa, would you mind just stopping to share your slides, please? Thanks. I thought I had, and they don't seem to have stopped. Oh, stop sharing. Sorry. I think there you are. Stop presenting. Hopefully, is have I gone or am I still there? No, that's yeah, perfect. Great. Thank you. Perfect. So um, maybe I'll let Tessa answer that, if that's OK. I, I'm, I'm on the basis that, that you, um, Tessa, you had a really interesting one, the Royal Brompton the other day, where um, a gentleman was having issues in the armed services because of his yeah. genetic. Yeah, and I think it, uh, it has huge impacts. I think it's a huge impact and it's a really, really difficult issue, which is why um, saying having a predictive test may be the better option, uh, but you don't have long QT syndrome until you've got evidence of the disease. But what do you call evidence of the disease? So do you call evidence of the disease when you have a prolonged QT or you don't shorten your QT interval on an exercise test? Does that mean you have long QT or does if you start treatment, you're done, aren't you? You, you, you have got long QT. And this is, I think, one of the huge problems is that people have been talking about starting treatment just on the genetic test, isn't it? So um, I think that with a, just a predictive test and no evidence of long QT um, on, let's say, a 24 hour tape, we want our patients to be safe. That is our only um, issue here, isn't it, is safety for our patients and their risk of developing an arrhythmia um, is low. You don't have to, I don't think you have a diagnosis of long QT if you're just avoiding the drugs on the high risk list. Um, and so I think that case that Jan um, talked about, Will, was really instructive, wasn't it? And I think what we have got to do is not give people a formal diagnosis. Um, and obviously, if you've got a prolonged QT interval and you need beta blockers, then you have to have that diagnosis, don't you? And that you're going to be rated. Um, and the armed forces are a particular issue. And for any of you who are dealing with the cardiomyopathies, their armed forces can insist on people having predictive testing. And the real problem here is they will refuse to let anyone join on the uh, presence of a mutation. Now, I don't know where they legally stand on this. The insurance um, industry can't do it. So the question um, that came through was here was about the insurance industry. So I think we can actually uh, get around that one by not starting beta blockers on low risk patients. But I don't think we're going to get around the armed forces is, is my impression until someone legally challenges them. Thank you both. Um, we've got a question from Nora Shannon and she says, can you talk about when to test healthy children for family familial HCM or DCM? Um, variants uh, when the parent is affected. Is that one for me as well? I, Probably, isn't it? Y yes, but, but I guess I have to follow up to that. If you if you then have a um, paediatric onset, um, obviously um, cardiomyopathy, do you then, um, does that change the way you, you, you recommend screening for let's say their sibling who's like seven years old or six years old? It would certainly change my um, uh, recommendation. Um, obviously, I'm not the cardiologist, 
But I think from a testing of children, I, I take a sort of a relatively pragmatic approach is we, my cardiology colleagues want to screen these children um, from a cardiac perspective. So if you are screening from a cardiac perspective, maybe you can save 50 percent of these children if you truly trust your genetic test. And that, of course, is what I am only doing it in. So I don't do genetic testing in Titan mutations because we're not sure if we truly touch, uh, trust the result. But if this is a good going MYH7 mutation, I think it's a huge advantage to actually do genetic testing. I prefer to do it when I can talk to the child. So I think um, I like to do it really from eight onwards, because otherwise somehow the parent has to break that in, that news to the child. And it's sometimes useful having a professional involvement in that process. So mine is a purely pragmatic um, uh, uh, approach. So it's really up to you cardiologists. If you're screening the children um, clinically, you believe they're at risk. If you did not believe they were at risk, you shouldn't be screening them. Um, <laughs> and I have terrible um, Barneys with my, uh, you know, my team because I'm always saying, well, you don't believe they're at risk at this age. Why are you, why are you screening them yet? But um, you know, I think it is a big problem. But I, I like it about late childhood, uh, so that I've engaged with the child just a little bit. And just to follow on from that, Tessa, if I can just ask you, Aoife, when do you start clinically screening, for example, for cardiomyopathy? And the same for question to Will. Yes, yeah, so we actually don't have a lower limit cutoff. Um, so historically, they used to say 12, and then we've published actually recently enough about our cohort of sarcomeric patients under 12 years, um, and uh, quite a significant number, and um, quite a kind of malignant phenotype. So we, the guidelines have actually changed and we, we don't have a lower limit for when we screen them. So once they're referred to us, we will screen them. The frequency with which that we screen them at certain ages varies. Um, so if we're referred a six month old um, and the family history is HCM in mum who was diagnosed in her 40s, then we probably won't see that child again for a couple of years. Um, but we would see them as soon as they're referred. Um, and then the frequency of follow-up depends on age um, and family history. And to follow on from what Tessa said, um, from the genetic side, a lot of it is family-led as well. Um, so we have some families where the family are just completely hell-bent on getting the genetic results from the get-go, which obviously brings up some tricky questions sometimes because obviously you're then genetic testing someone that doesn't have any say in the matter, um, which which is a bit tricky. But but as Tess said, it, it is nicer when the patients are on board and when you can talk to them. So then there doesn't have to be a second kind of reveal of information to families when the, the, the older children then find out. And then sometimes we do find those tricky situations where parents want the genetic testing, but they don't want the children to know, mm. uh, which is I find the most difficult um, and a bit of a minefield. But no, there is no lower limit when we screen. In our practice, anyway, I don't know if everyone's doing that, but that, that's what we're doing. Super interesting. And Will, your thoughts? Same answer. Um, <laughs> and, and I think actually a lot of that is driven by the, the families as well. So um, I guess in order of those we screen most frequently would be families of long, uh, with the diagnosis of long QT, then probably Brigada and CPVT is, is, is less common. And I guess pragmatically, some of the testing you can't do early on. So CPVT is a good example of that. Um, and similar to Aoife, I think depending on what um, the families come to clinic in terms of timing of genetic testing, for example, and then the frequency of follow up, I think that varies a lot between those that we're seeing, the, result, the initial results that we've got. And sometimes we see very early on in life and then say, OK, we'll see you in two, three years time because there's really very little to do for now. I think from my perspective, um, look at trying to see hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, looking at the thickness um, by echocardiogram is jolly difficult in a wriggling two year old. So I'm very, very uncertain that you're um, really going to be able to do a decent echo looking for sort of one millimeter difference in a in a wriggly little person. 
so I feel that unless the, the, there's a malignant family history, you should be not starting screening them until their life they'll lie still. Um, I know you're all brilliant, but I still think um, how you can tell one millimeter difference is it, 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 I, I'm amazed <laughs> and skeptical. <laughs> All, all five points of QT interval in an artifact uh, ECG in a screening child. So, <laughs> yeah, well, I was thinking yours was easier, Will. <laughs> uh, well, thanks so much for this um, interesting discussion. I think there's a lot, lot more we could go on, I think, on this. Um, mm. But we'll move on to the next speaker now. But thank you so much for your talks and also your, um, your cases and your contributions to this discussion. Thank you so Sorry much. about my technology. I can't understand how it's still bad after all this time, but there we are. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.